<laughs> it's our, our thing that we've trained for for years is sorting out PowerPoint presentations. Um, so thanks so much for inviting me to come speak here. It's a real honor and a privilege, and it's been a really interesting uh, symposium for me so far. But I have to say, when I was invited to come present and saw that the slot I got was titled uh, Population Genetic Approaches to Antibiotic Resistant Tuberculosis, I freaked out a little bit um, because I'm kind of a moron when it comes to population genetics. Uh, I don't think I've calculated linkage disequilibrium for anything since I was, I don't know, maybe like 19 or 20 as an undergraduate, and I don't think I could mathematically model my way out of a wet paper bag. Um, but I realized I do actually have a, a different, um, but I think valid, perspective on population genetics. And instead of um, traditional population genetics, uh, what I think I bring to the table is uh, what, for lack of a better word, I will call population comma genetics. So instead of this, um, basically analyzing bacterial uh, populations using genetic approaches, I'm interested in looking at pathogens using genetics, and more specifically whole genome sequencing, um, but instead of looking at a population of pathogens, um, I look at populations of humans and how you see genomic sort of signatures um, of microevolution as a pathogen moves through a human population. And and I'm not talking about global human populations either. I work very much on the kind of localized um, outbreak or community level transmission scale. And the tool that I use to look at things from the population perspective is social network analysis, which happily I do not have to introduce because we saw a little bit of it this morning. We treat um, individuals as well as the locations that they frequent as nodes in a network. And if an individual knows somebody else in the network, we connect them by an edge. Or if they attend a particular place, we draw on a link between them. Um, so it's a very different approach to population genetics. But I would argue that um, understanding local dynamics is tremendously important. So I work at scales like this. Um, the background here is Vancouver's downtown east side, which is one of the most um, sort of marginalized neighborhoods in Canada. Uh, our rates of tuberculosis there are about 10 times the national average, but it's all confined in what is essentially a square kilometer, which might be a square 0.06 of a mile or something. I am very bad at Imperial. Um, but yeah, it's all in this region that I've shown on the screen. And to understand, um, transmission dynamics of a pathogen, we really do have to stop and think about how does it behave in these small communities. And I would say that this understanding at the local level is really just as important as um, what we've been talking about for the last day and a half, which is understanding at more of a global level. And some of the work that Caroline just showed on um, the IPT therapy um, for tuberculosis in high incidence regions shows that when you go and you treat a disease like tuberculosis, you can generally do a fairly good job, except for these resistant sort of pockets that hang on, localized pockets where you just can't get rid of the disease. And so understanding local dynamics by studying outbreaks and studying community level transmission is really what we need to know about if we want to eventually get in and rid those pockets of disease. And this is not a new idea um, by any sense of the means. Um, smallpox eradication is a really perfect example of this. So we have been vaccinating people against smallpox ever since Edward Jenner did his cow experiments. Um, but it wasn't until somebody actually took a very close look at the dynamics of local transmission and realized that rather than this sort of global vaccination approach, what we should be doing is ring vaccination around cases that have been identified. And with that very simple insight into local dynamics, we were able to, in essentially a decade, um, do what people had been trying to do for centuries, which was eradicate smallpox. So that's my little public service announcement about why it's important to study things at the local level. And I'll give you a couple examples of um, what we do in that field with respect to tuberculosis. 
So our very first uh, foray into this sort of field, which I like to call genomic epidemiology, and I would like to emphasize the epidemiology. This is very much research that is built on having good quality epidemiological data. I sometimes complain about working at a center for disease control because we don't have a lot of time nor money um, for research, but we do have access to a pr tremendous amount of epidemiological data uh, that really enables us to get great local insights. <clears throat> Genomic epidemiology and using whole genome sequencing as an epidemiological tool is a fairly new field, particularly in bacteria. I think really one of the first um, papers that illustrated this nicely was Ed's paper that was presented this morning about uh, MRSA um, and in particular that Thai hospital outbreak. Um, but ours was certainly amongst the first handful of papers in the field, um, and it came out earlier this year in New England Journal. This will also serve as my acknowledgment slide. Thank you to everybody whose name is in gray. Uh, uh, as well as Genome BC, uh, SFU, and First Nations Inuit Health, who gave us the money to do this. Um, if you want the dirty technical details, it's all in there and in the supplementary information. I will just give you a very brief flyover of this project um, and how we're taking the lessons learned from that project and applying it to a new outbreak uh, that's going on. So this particular outbreak happened between 2006 and 2008 in a fairly small community in British Columbia. It was a medium-sized town, but the outbreak occurred in a very specific subpopulation within that town. We had 41 cases over that three-year period, and when you use the um, subset population's numbers as a denominator, you actually get an incidence rate that was similar to sub-Saharan Africa. So it was really, although small in terms of caseload, um, a huge outbreak in terms of um, actual TB rates. And as you would expect, in an outbreak, all of the cases had an identical genotype. Uh, TB is genotyped by something called Miru VNTR, which is um, conceptually similar to MLST that we saw yesterday, but it uses uh, variable number tandem repeats instead of housekeeping genes. So we do 24 loci Miru VNTR. All of the cases were identical, and interestingly, all of the cases um, shared a fingerprint with a, um, a strain that had been seen in that very same community uh, seven times in the preceding 15 years. This community was certainly no stranger to tuberculosis. Cases were detected generally um, once or twice a year, and that strain had been around. It just hadn't caused a giant outbreak of disease for some reason. And that particular observation led to um, a friendly wager at CDC. Um, two of our senior staff members were sitting around one day, around the poker table, uh, discussing um, this particular outbreak, and each had thought they had the explanation for it. One of the folks said that likely something had changed about the genetics of the organism that somehow made it more transmissible or more virulent. It was a change that wouldn't register at the genotype level, but might be revealed by whole genome sequence. <clears throat> and the other person said, no, 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 the agent is only one part of the epidemiological triangle, which is, of course, host, agent, and environment, and they suggested that perhaps something had changed about the hosts making them more susceptible or something about the environment that gave the bug a chance to really expand. So the bet was settled um, when one of my colleagues, Patrick Tang, decided that whole genome sequencing would be a really interesting thing to throw at this outbreak. So we used the Illumina platform to sequence a whole bunch of the outbreak cases, as well as some of the historical strains that had the same uh, Miru pattern. And I will very quickly say that um, the results of that bet was that, in fact, it was something about the host or something about the environment that had changed. There was absolutely no genetic difference we saw in the bugs that could have explained why it never caused an outbreak um, for 15 years, and all of a sudden it caused one of the biggest outbreaks in BC's history. For that, um, the person that lost the bet had to buy us all a free lunch. It was the only free lunch I've ever gotten out of BC CDC, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> But after the free lunch, I was given the rest of this data and told to make something of it. Um, so the first piece of the data set were the genome sequences. We had 32 from the outbreak cases, and we had four of the seven historical strains with the same genotype. Now, TB's genome is about um, 5 million or so base pairs, and with 32 genomes, you end up with about 160 million base pairs of data. But fortunately, because TB is such a clonal bug, um, you can describe 
all of its variation in this one slide. Uh, you can collapse it down to just a few single nucleotide polymorphisms that differentiate the outbreak strains from each other. And not all of these are even informative. I mean, some of these are present only in a single uh, isolate. And I should mention these have all been quality filtered using a whole bunch of extensive things. So we're fairly confident in these SNPs. So this is the data set that I spent you know, six months um, banging my head against my desk over trying to figure out what to do with, um, because I was trying to interpret it in the context of social network data, which was the other piece of data that uh, I was given. And I won't, again, go into great detail about this because we heard a bit about it earlier. It did really sort of come to public health from sexually transmitted infection uh, contact investigations. Richard Rothenberg's written some really excellent articles that I recommend. And more recently, it's been applied to TB outbreak investigations in um, sort of difficult to reach populations, people uh, for whom contact tracing in its most traditional form um, really fails quite miserably. So with the social network data that I was given, and it came all piecemeal, and I had to collate it together, um, fortunately, I spent my postdoc working on um, networks in uh, innate immunity and had sort of an idea of how to put it together and how to visualize it. And we ended up with this. <coughs> which looks like a ball of yarn that your cat would play with, or in systems biology uh, terminology, a hairball. And what you've got in this particular network around the outside are your cases of active tuberculosis. Around the inside are locations that they frequented. There's some community centers, crack houses. Solid lines connect individuals to each other when they have a social relationship, they're friends, or perhaps they use drugs together, or um, they are family members. And dashed lines connect individuals to places that they spent a fair amount of time at. So in a perfect world, you would be able to reconstruct an outbreak fairly simply. And I have to say, um, because nobody had really done this genomic epidemiology business at the point we were working through this analysis, we naively went into things thinking that you know, it was going to be beautiful and work perfectly, and we could basically sketch out who infected whom on the back of a napkin. We would be able to trace the uh, origin of individual SNPs, and going back to the epidemiological data would be able to sort of do this back and forth between the, the genomic data and the epi data and say, okay, here's a genotype, who did that arise in, who did they have contact with and might have transferred the bug with that same genotype too. This does work. Um, there's a really great paper on uh, looking at the genomic epidemiology of an MDR uh, Acinetobacter bomanii uh, outbreak in a hospital done by friends of ours from Birmingham. Um, but that is an acute illness where their outbreak spanned about six weeks. Um, in tuberculosis world, which is very different from a perfect world, uh, there's all sorts of complicating factors that make that very simple sort of back of the napkin reconstruction totally impossible. You're dealing with the fact that this is a chronic infection. You've also got, this is one of the most annoying ones, uh, the issue about delays in diagnosis. So imagine, if you will, somebody that is sick for quite a long time and in the marginalized populations like the homeless or the drug users where TB likes to hang out in British Columbia, <coughs> You get people that don't seek medical attention for a long time, so in every outbreak we have, there are a number of individuals who are sometimes symptomatic and infectious for 8 or 10 or 12 months. So imagine you've got somebody like this, they cough on somebody in January, that person is um, sick quite soon after that and is picked up, we take their sputum sample and we sequence it and we get their genome. But the person that infected them, perhaps they're not diagnosed until December, in the interim their bug is accruing all sorts of mutations, um, particularly in people that uh, are engaged in behaviors like drug use, for example, um, that affect their immune system. We know this affects the evolutionary rate. Um, so when they're finally diagnosed and their sputum is taken in December and we sequence the genome from that, all of a sudden it's quite different from the genome uh, that we got out of the person they infected in January. So it can be very difficult to tie cases together um, in that very simple way I just showed you. We also know that TB has a really unusual molecular clock, the intricacies of which we're only just beginning to appreciate. We have no idea to what extent the culture period, um, and we generally grow these things for about six weeks to get enough DNA to sequence. We have no idea how many mutations are introduced during that time. 
And also TB is full of repetitive regions. Bacteria obviously love these because they're easy to mutate and engender sort of antigenic and surface variation. But next generation sequencers absolutely hate these things. So it's really difficult to figure out what's a sequencing error and what's a legitimate single nucleotide polymorphism, particularly because we know they should be accruing in these regions. So our solution to that was just to treat the whole genome sequence as a finer resolution genotyping or molecular fingerprinting tool and look at phylogenetic clades and describe those as sort of finer subtypes. And in this particular outbreak, we essentially had two large clades, lineage A we call them and lineage B. Um, and the astute amongst you will realize that this meant there was probably not a single source for the outbreak. There were probably two, perhaps three distinct source cases, which is what we found. So we decided to use these clades as basically, as I said, a higher resolution genotyping tool and use it to prune the social network according to a series of rules to basically end up with the most parsimonious transmission network. So I'll just go through this very quickly. We started with the complete social network, and then we pulled out just the lineage A cases and their relationships to each other. We did the same for B. We also interpreted this in the context of uh, clinical presentation. In TB, we know some people are more infectious than others, so we were able to rule out some people as basically dead ends for transmission, take out any edges shown in gray that were emanating from those folks. And we were also able to go back and use the genomic data to um, resolve some ambiguous transmission events. Uh, I won't go into detail of how we did this on the slide, but we were able to go back and look at the genomics again. We were able to reconstruct the um, complete outbreak, and the major findings that I think impacted the way we deal with TB in British Columbia um, was, first of all, the fact that this was, as I alluded to earlier, a socio-environmental driver. We realized that it was the introduction of crack cocaine into the community which really primed this uh, network for the spread of tuberculosis, which suggested some things around doing behavioral surveillance in addition to disease surveillance, uh, the opportunity to use harm reduction principles, um, as well as the importance of latent TB in uh, communities that are struggling with addiction issues, particularly ones that have as dense a social network as this one. And we also found that uh, amongst our source, uh, source cases, one of their defining characteristics was the degree in the network, uh, that they were highly connected individuals. And so this is suggested to us now in contact tracing investigations that one of the questions we should be asking isn't just, you know, who do you share a home with or who do you work with or who are your friends, but who is the most popular person you know? Um, these popular people can act as sort of sentinel nodes in a network to alert you to the presence of disease. And and they're people that, if they have latent tuberculosis, really should be targeted with um, preventative therapy uh, so that if they do activate, they're not going to spread it to all of their very many social contacts. So we're applying the same approach to an outbreak um, that happened, of course, just as the previous one ended. You can never go without a TB outbreak, it seems, which is good because it means I'll always have a job. Um, but this one, as opposed to happening uh, elsewhere in the province, is uh, occurring in the Kelowna region of Vancouver. And unlike the outbreak that I just showed you, which had a very densely connected social network and was very much driven by people and highly connected individuals, this one is very much driven by locations. Um, it's a place place-based outbreak centered around homeless shelters. And what happened in this particular outbreak is around the end of 2006, 2007, we have our suspected index case from the Vancouver area. Um, we have two isolates from this person, one that is fully susceptible uh, and one that displays low-level isoniazid resistance. And this individual left the ward harboring what we suspect is a mixed population of bacteria um, and either directly or indirectly somehow seeded a number of cases, including this Kelowna outbreak, which is up to 36 cases and and other seven cases elsewhere in the province. Interestingly, in the Kelowna outbreak, we do see a mixed resistance phenotype. Most people have this low-level INH resistance, but some are also still sensitive. 
We have really extensive social network data on all of our active cases, and we also have contact data for all of the, well, the majority of the potential exposures. These were people that through their attendance at shelters or community centers or hospitals would have been exposed to an active case, and we followed them quite extensively, um, including serial skin testing, so we know, you know that somebody may have had three negative skin tests and then suddenly converted uh, to a positive skin test. We've got 300, just over 300 positive skin tests so far, of which about a third are re uh, receiving preventative therapy. So we've got a tremendous amount of really interesting data, and the whole genome sequences for all of these cases um, should be back in our hands in about four weeks. We shipped them off to our genome center to sequence a little while ago. So with the toolbox that we developed in that first outbreak, we're hoping to now answer some questions about um, what's going on in this current outbreak. Um, we don't know the mutation that's responsible for the resistance phenotype. We've sequenced INHA and CATG, and it's nothing, none of the canonical ones. We're interested in looking at the balance between uh, genotype and phenotype in terms of resistance. Um, is there any sort of compensatory mutation that's traveling along with this resistance mutation, and what exactly is its effect on um, the fitness of the bug? Are our resistant cases leading to more TST-positive contacts from that great database we have? We also have something super cool. Um, one of the shelters where uh, transmission really seems to have um, kind of occurred at the beginning of the outbreak has maps of who slept where every single night going back decades, and they've offered these maps to us, and so we're able to go through and say, okay, on any given night, this is where this particular infectious case was sleeping. It was fairly consistent, because you go in, you get your bed number, and you also have a little cubby with like pajamas and a towel and things, so people tend to sleep in the same bed number, because it was associated with their cubby number, um, so people would stay in one location, and they would move into the shelter for the season. So you've got one individual in one place, and all his bed neighbors are going to be the same, <clears throat> I say his because it was a men's shelter, um, and about 90% of our cases are gentlemen. So we know where these fellows were sleeping every night for months on end, and it'll be really interesting to see um, exactly how the bug transmitted in that shelter environment. Um, what's our long-term progression of disease? And there are so many more things we can answer. Um, I saw Peter Donald's name on uh, one of Rob Warren's slides, and I saw a really great presentation from Peter where he had talked about some of the fundamental questions in tuberculosis that have been around for uh, decades, really, and nobody's been ab able to answer. And I think with these sort of uh, genomic epidemiology studies, we might actually have a crack at answering a few of those. So the takeaway points, um, I think understanding things at the local level is really critical um, to our understanding of transmission dynamics and the design of evidence-based control strategies for pathogens like tuberculosis, especially as we move towards this sort of global eradication where we know our models tell us that there are going to be these sort of hyper-endemic pockets that hang on. And I would really like to emphasize that underlying this type of local work is good quality epidemiological data. When it comes to population genetics, we need to re um, remember that, you know, these diseases are spreading through a population, and it's a human population that isn't just some sort of amorphous, um, fleshy blob that's totally homogeneous. These are real people with real social relationships and links and behaviors, uh, and we need to keep that in mind. So befriend your local epidemiologist. We have lots of data, and we often don't have the resources to analyze it, um, but we do think that we have much to offer to the, the global understanding of transmission dynamics of pathogens. So with that, I'll finish up. Thank you.